um, the nation's leading training center for professional journalists. He was dean of faculty there for five years. He taught writing and reporting on race relations, ethics, and diversity. Uh, he has served since as uh, chairman of two Pulitzer Prize juries in editorial writing and commentary. And for 16 years was a reporter, city editor, editorial writer, and columnist for the New Orleans Times Picayune. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees, both in social work, from Dillard University, the bachelor's, and Tulane. So Keith. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to just do a, um, a brief introduction of our panels. So you have the, um, the longer uh, bios in the program. And then um, uh, what I've suggested to them is that we'll have us a little conversation amongst us and then uh, uh, turn to the audience for questions. So from my left to right, your right to left, uh, Eric Vaughn. He is the host of his own talk show on WNOV uh, in Milwaukee, handling some of the toughest issues uh, of the city uh, from that, that platform. He's also a host of Precious Lives, and now the follow-up uh, Beyond the Gunshots, a project spanning three news organizations, um, two years, and, um, and, and again, tackling the issues of, of violence but also the issues of poverty um, the, and, uh, and shedding a light now on the causes of uh, some of these major social justice issues in, in the city. Uh, to his left, Dr. Marie, Maria Len Rios, an associate professor of advertising and PR at the College of Journalism and Communications of the University of Georgia. She's also co-editor of a new book, Cross-Cultural Journalism, communicating strategically about diversity. Uh, and to her left, Brent Jones, USA Today's Standards and Ethics Editor. Uh, Brent also leads one of the industry's strongest internship programs and speaks to issues of diversity uh, from that platform. Uh, so welcome, panel. Thank you. Uh, our task today is to talk some about what we might uh, do looking forward uh, in coverage of matters of race and, and ethnicity. Uh, and we, we might obser observe, and, and as um, Nicole Hannah-Jones said earlier today, that in some ways journalism is, has rediscovered this issue in significant ways across the country. Uh, the LA Times, as, uh, uh, as we just heard a moment ago, uh, now has someone covering this issue again. Uh, NPR's Code Switch, as Ka Katie mentioned, was born three years ago uh, as an effort to climb into the, 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 uh, the issues of, of race, ethnicity, and culture uh, from the perspective, in many cases, of a new generation of people living that life. Uh, we see it uh, at USA Today, we see it uh, now at the New York Times with their conversations about race. Uh, multiple outlets in the digital space, uh, many of uh, public radio stations, in fact, across the country now launching teams to cover this. So, so we're in a, in a, I think, in a good moment, um, uh, again, in journalism, uh, uh, looking into this issue. But I want to I begin with a, a general question for the three of you and then uh, start climbing into the specifics. I, I asked before to, to, for you to think about three things uh, that journalism can do to go deeper on race uh, than we are doing now. And, and Maria, I'll start with you uh, and, and, and then Eric. Sure. Um, I've been teaching on the issue of cross-cultural journalism for over a decade. And um, some of the things that always come up when I teach courses on diversity is a question of, you know, students are fearful to ask questions as it relates to diversity because they're scared of saying the wrong thing. So one of the things that I think, you know, to move our coverage deeper and better, and especially something that, you know, most people have to do is put yourself in a situation where you feel uncomfortable and to face the fear of perhaps admitting that you don't know the answer, and, but it's okay to ask the question 
Because if you don't ask the question, you'll never find an answer, right? So I think part of it is, is telling, well, from my perspective as an educator, right, is to tell young people, you need, it's okay not to have the answer, but one of the things you need to do is recognize and have humility when you don't have the answer and to seek out the answer from people who can give you the answer that you need to tell a successful story. And then the, another thing that you have to do is mentally check yourself. And I think, you know, we've talked about, you know, objectivity and, you know, I believe also that there's no, you know, true form of objectivity. And when you're talking to students, I mean, it's more of a process, right? Have you looked at, you know, and I, you know, Keith came up with this concept of excellent and excellence in his book, The Authentic Voice, um, years ago. And some of those things that you have to ask when you're writing a story that would be excellent is, have you taken the context into account? Have you looked at the complexity of the story? And if you, objectivity is a process of asking those questions to make sure that you've gotten the appropriate background, that you've gotten the appropriate context, that you've actually talked to people and gotten the voices of people and brought their voices carefully um, and respectfully into your story. And so I think that that is really important to creating um, good journalism. And then the third thing that I think that that's really important that we've touched on in earlier panels and is the use of language. And I think language is very important and the terms that you use are very important because they're related to people's identity. And I think that it's part of in bringing people's voices carefully to the story that you allow people to define who they are instead of defining people for them, themselves. And I think people get upset, or readers get upset, and I think um, Nicole talked about this at the beginning when she was talking about describing you know, someone's house and her story as a Pepto-Abysmal house, you know, the color of pink, and the, the subject of the story didn't like that because that embarrassed her. She didn't want you know, her house to be a Pepto-Abysmal pink. And I think that's part of showing respect for the people in your story and, and allowing their voices to come through with respect, so I think that's, language is very important to that. Great. Well, well Eric, you know, we, we actually spent some time talking about language when, when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, and you, you, you mentioned then um, the need for journalism to, to A, talk straight about what it's, um, what it's trying to say, not use coded language to refer to communities and to, or to refer to people. Uh, say more about the value of that and anything else that you think um, Journalism well, needs to do. I think the language issue is, is probably the more difficult of all of the things that uh, we have to, in, in our ways of communicating a story or a message, um, because it requires understanding not only the issue, but the people you're talking to and the people you're talking about. Um, and, and oftentimes, when you read stories, uh, one of the things that, as an example, that I, I think I gave to Keith when we were talking is something as simple as uh, in Milwaukee, one of the things that we, when you're reading a newspaper story there, they often refer to the perpetrators or even the victims in some cases of crimes as being on the north side or south side. So you automatically, or you almost automatically know who they're talking about, who the perpetrators are. So uh, to the newsroom, it's not offensive. It's not intended to be offensive, I would say, uh, but to the readers, and, and again, I hear a lot of these things through my talk show. Um, there often are comments about the way the story talks about the people or, we, or actually omits the obvious from some of the stories and talks in what I would say is this coded language. And then we accept that. But I, I think that part of that comes back to, uh, and I know the previous panel mentioned it a bit, and that is the, the, the makeup of the newsroom, the diversity of newsrooms. Um, one of the things my bio doesn't talk about is a few years that I worked at the WISN uh, affiliate, or the ABC affiliate in Milwaukee, WISN TV. And there were no black producers. Um, there were no, there were few black reporters. Um, and, and at the same time, there were few or no Latino reporters. Uh, all of the producers were white, 
for the most part, they were young, which I think has an impact on the way stories are told. Uh, but certainly, race, and particularly in a city like Milwaukee, where usually the breaking news, the news stories that, or I should say, the, the opening news story is about something that's happened in the community, and that being the black community where something violent has happened or something criminal has happened, is covered by, or is, it's, it's the, the producers who make the decision about covering it, are white, possibly, or probably young, and their whole approach to the story, I think, is different than it would be if that person were black, first of all, and maybe a little more seasoned. I think one of the things that I've noticed is that there's so much transition uh, in, in the news business now with new people coming in, uh, particularly in the TV business. You have stations in the Milwaukee area, for instance, that have kind of traded out a number of the senior reporters and probably even senior producers for younger people who they can pay less. And so we were talking, I think the previous panel talked about the economics of all of this. Uh, they pay them less. and. These are people who come in and know very little about the community that they're going to cover. And so there's a, there's a vacuum there that, that's created because of that ignorance uh, of, of the community that they're charged with telling these very sometimes complex stories. They're not, it may be a murder, but they're, and part of the reason we're doing the before the gunshots is because we want to look at why these things occur. And we don't maybe because of time constraints, maybe because of economics, maybe because it's just easier to tell the story uh, in its most basic form, the, the complex matters that may have driven the story are often omitted. Uh, so I think those things, I, I fought to try to think of three, but I think it's the uh, newsroom makeup and, and, and uh, the lack of diversity in many newsrooms, and that is both, uh, I would say both electronic media and print, uh, too, although it seems print is getting better. Um, and then also um, just the, the, the fact that you have people who just are unfamiliar with the community that they're supposed to serve. So, thank you. And Brent? Well, first of all, let me just say that after hearing a lot of the conversations today about the uh, problems within newsrooms and the things that we need to fix, it makes me feel a lot better about having my job a little longer considering that I did a lot with accuracy. Um, so, so thank you for helping me to stay employed. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, this has been a really great day of listening to a lot of interesting conversations, very impassioned uh, dialogue today. And it just makes me think about, you know, when we talk about the three things that journalists can do, you know, one of them I think is, you know, a more nuanced, perhaps approach that we are, if we want nuance in our, our, our outcome with the coverage that maybe our approach should be a little more nuanced in the way that we have our dialogues, particularly within our newsroom. You know, one of the aspects of my job, I run our internship program and I, I do a lot of mentoring and I actually mentor a lot of particularly uh, young white men and we have really open, frank dialogues about journalism. and. Oftentimes, I'll hear back that they don't really understand that this is a conversation about them and when we talk about diversity. And I think that we need to find more, cre we need, well, I don't think we need to find, I think there is a great framework for the conversation. It was uh, introduced to the industry by Robert Maynard, who is a pioneering journalist of color who really understands not only the issue, who understood the issue of diversity, but as a columnist, he also understood the art of persuasion. Um, this is not a new issue. This is something that we've been wrestling with for a very long time, so I think we need to look at how we're talking about it. Um, and, and, and what I like about uh, the fault lines uh, from Maynard in, in, in bringing that back up again, because I think it's just as relevant today as it was when we were much more print-centric and we didn't know about social media, but he broke it out beyond talking about race, but race, you know, looking at white and black, uh, ethnicity as well, but also looking at what are those other areas that speak to uh, uh, breakdowns within um, the, the diversity dialogue, whether it's uh, generational, uh, geography, 
I don't want to forget it, gender, I think, which includes also LGBT community issues. And I think when you create an atmosphere where everybody feels included as a part of this conversation, where those voices are heard, I think we can then begin to uh, see more examples of more nuanced coverage. I also think, and someone alluded to it in the panel before, that even in our description of news organizations that we become more nuanced in how we describe this idea, the media. It's sometimes, we're doing some of the same things uh, that we, to, to our, in, our, in our dialogue about media that we say that we want to move away from within our community. So just making sure that we're consistent. The other thing I think is when we look inside of just within the newsroom and how we approach coverage, you know, uh, resisting the urge to fall into the trap of ethnic um, blame discourse where, you know, stories about terrorism, quick to blame, you know, Muslims, uh, immigration, you know, to Mexicans, uh, you know, crime up to blacks, you know, and, and these kinds of, of, of conversations require time and, and, and more thoughtfulness or reflection I think we need to have. You know, there's this tendency to fast forward, full speed ahead. I don't think we're having enough reflective moments, even in our, 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 our frustration, and there's reason for a lot of the frustration, but I think if we can figure out better ways to bring everyone who needs to be at the table, because this can't get done. I was, I was at a meeting not too long ago, it was about a week ago, with our chief people officer, you know, a lot of times, even when we talk about hiring, it's been relegated pretty much in a singular way. It's, you know, it's, it's HR, the, the recruiters, but we need to be more nuanced in our approach to even our diversity strategy where we're bringing the, the chief strategy officer needs to be at the table. The chief content officer needs to be at the table. We need to be looking, the products officer needs to be at the table so that we're making sure that our approach is as inclusive as the outcomes that we want, whether it's our content or our products. Great. Well, so, Maria, when we talk about the, um, uh, the, the need for the journalists to have the capacity for having these conversations about race and, and, and ethnicity, uh, when we're talking about uh, the, the point that, that Brent makes, that there are uh, people often, uh, men in conversations about gender, uh, white people in conversations about race, who feel that the that the the, the story I mean, that the the conversation is about them, but not does, doesn't include them? How in the academy do we get um, uh, students, journalists, prepared for that kind of discourse? Right. Well, you know, we try to tell everyone that you know, reporting about journalism, we go back to the history, right, to the, the Hutchins Commission and the Kerner Report, and we talk about the responsibility of journalism to represent society, and it's everybody's responsibility who works in journalism, not just the journalists who are people of color or who represent specific um, groups, and, and that it is a matter for society to create a better society that we represent a variety of viewpoints and people from our community. And I think, you know, I think we still do come up against the pushback of the idea that I don't see how this includes me. And, and I think, you know, that's hard sometimes to counteract and sometimes in a response, you know, you get the response that, you know, this diversity in journalism is just political correctness. And that's a term that comes up and, you know, how, how do you respond to that? Because oftentimes when I hear that word come up, the question is, well, what do you mean by that? You know, what does political correctness mean to you? And a lot of times the response is, well, it's, it's me writing or saying what, what I think you would, I should say, so not as to make you feel bad, right? Well, if we're talking about having real conversations with people, if you, are not feeling like you're comfortable, then there's a lack of trust there. Because if you're not willing to be honest with me in a conversation, if you think that you have to be politically correct to talk to me, then you don't trust me to have that conversation. And then we have a bigger problem, right? How, how do we fix that relationship so we can have an honest and productive conversation where you don't feel like you have to put on a front to talk to me 
and, and where we can say, okay, let's just be honest with each other. Even if we don't agree, we don't have to agree, right? But we can have that kind of honest conversation. And you have to kind of try to get to the point where you feel like you can be comfortable being honest with each other. That's one of the reasons why I really like fault lines. And by the way, no plug for any personal reason other than I really think it's important because it's baked in sort of as we do the who, what, when, how, and where of reporting. You ask, you know, how does this story look through each of these prisms, from the prisms of race, from the prism of gender, with every story. So it's not like we're singling out one aspect, which they all are important. And you have to have very as distinct experiences to understand those, those prisms to be able to see that story. But I think if we embedded it in a lot of our conversations, whether it's on the campus, and, there's, and, and it's gonna take everybody doing this. But I do think what I love about Fault Lines is that it does create an atmosphere of more inclusive dialogue around all of these prisms that are hugely important and will only become more important. And quite frankly, you're right, some of our, some of our news and managers in, in, in the industry aren't listening, but the same way that technology crept up on us and disrupted our business, I mean, we're, we're gonna be forced, there's a business imperative now. It's, it's doing the right thing, we've been saying that, it's the right thing, but now there's a business imperative that is going to force us to understand that we have to treat our audiences as consumers of interest and not just objects of study. And, and that's you know, and really important. So Eric, when we talked, you, you said that you could, if you wanted, um, just show up at work, turn the microphone on and say, we're gonna talk about race today and you would never have to, um, to prompt the audience again. People are that interested in talking about it. When you look across the country in 2015 at the number of stories from Rachel Dolezal to Tamir Rice uh, to the, the young Muslim, uh, of the, the Muslim family shot in North Carolina to any number of stories across the, uh, the range of that year, uh, we don't want for conversation starters. But how do we get to a place, particularly for journalism trying uh, to explore this, where we get deep and thoughtful in the conversation itself? Well, what I, what I was referring to are those nights when I have um, other obligations or I just watch a late baseball game or football game or something and I don't prepare as I should for the next morning. Um, and I get lazy, so I go in and I go to the, uh, the easy route. Uh, just many years of doing this has told me that people get engaged in the conversation. Usually, they're able to tell you about something that happened to them um, you know, in the last 24 hours that sparks many other calls that uh, people relate their, their situations. But I, I don't know, I've been in other types of settings where uh, you know, we've got corporations that uh, have said, I was involved in a project 20 years ago now, it was called Through One City's Eyes, and uh, the problems in Milwaukee around race go back many, many, many decades, but um, this was a look at racism in Milwaukee from 1960 to 1990, and some of the major corporations around Milwaukee, Harley-Davidson, Miller Brewing Company, um, just about five or six major corporations decided that they were going to address the problems of race in the city and never again would we look back at this, the situation that existed in the 60s and 70s and even before then. Um, there was, that was supposed to be this honest and open and sincere discussion amongst really smart people about dealing with, with race. It was about the corporate leadership of those companies saying from the top down, we're gonna deal with this. And just like with my talk show, there were people who uh, told their stories, talked about it uh, for a little while, and then it went away. The, the, the corporate involvement, the, the top-down approach. In fact, we, it was a multimedia project where we did radio, television, and even video, and then we went into schools to talk to kids about race. But we had a huge panel discussion. We had 10, 12 people on the panel, including, well, finally included the mayor of the city at the time, 
uh, John Norquist, who before agreeing to be a part of the panel, insisted that he would not be a part of it because race wasn't a problem in Milwaukee. So, you know, um, it, it, even when you have people who have a true stake in trying to uh, alleviate the problems associated with race or eliminate racism, uh, you don't get the, the, the sincere, in-depth kind of discussion. Uh, you don't get any more of it than you do with the everyday people who pick up the phone and call my show and are reacting emotionally. These people came, the people in the corporate community came to the table supposedly equipped to not only talk about it, but to do something about it. And, and so I, I think that my, my analysis, the analysis of it at this point would be that the folks at the grassroots, the folks who pick up the phone and call probably have, could have a greater impact on moving it than the people who claim to have this great interest in, in, in rerouting it. Uh, so. Well, if, if you would just say a little bit about uh, Precious Lives and the, the, the effort itself uh, to, to put, put some context to this, I'd also like you to talk about what, having now worked with this uh, team of journalists, uh, what, you, what you've learned about the needs of journalism on this topic from that experience. So just first a little bit about Precious Lives. Well, Precious Lives is a two-year um, project that uh, looks at uh, the victims of crime, particularly young people in the city of Milwaukee, and in fact, we, uh, in the second year of the project, it's in the second year, we've done, uh, it's a weekly project, so it was 52 weeks, uh, the first year, 52 the second week, and we're into uh, whatever week this is, you kind of lose track along the way. But um, we look at the, the victims of crime, tell their stories, because as you know, the um, shelf life of those kinds of stories are pretty short. Uh, everyone gets emotional about them uh, when they happen, and then, just as quickly as they are the news story, they, they evaporate. Our intention was to keep those victims of, the, of these crimes top of mind, because if something was going to happen to change uh, the, the level of violence in the city, it was going to be about the people who were victimized and people really committing to doing something about it. So uh, it's unfortunate that we have enough stories uh, to, to do, that we could plan to do enough stories for two years uh, around this kind of uh, subject matter, but we do, and, and we have, we've tried to expand that to other areas. So that's a little bit about the project. I think for the journalists who are working on it, we, uh, I, I was asked by the lead producer, the executive producer, I'm the lead producer, we have an executive producer, we have a lot of producers, and <laughs> I don't know, it takes a lot to produce what we're doing, but the executive producer uh, is a guy named Brad Lichtenstein, who asked me to participate um, just based on the work that I've done around these kinds of things uh, in both print, oh, excuse me, both uh, radio and television. And uh, we hired a young lady who came here from Sitka, Alaska. She was actually, she's actually originally from Rhode Island. Um, but she's come in and immersed herself in these stories. And uh, it's been an awakening for her. She was oblivious to this kind of lifestyle that, that and it's become a lifestyle for her. It's become a lifestyle. She's found that there's a lifestyle involved in the stories that we're telling, and the people of the stories that we're telling. Many of these people who are committing these crimes, many of the victims of these crimes know each other. Um, they travel in the same circles. They do the same things. Um, but she was totally unaware that anything like this existed. So for her, as a journalist, it was eye-opening, um, it was shocking, it's shock, still shocking to me uh, after a year and a quarter that she can, that she, first of all, that she's been able to sustain herself because it's very demanding kind of reporting. You're dealing with very emotional issues. She, um, though, has talked about uh, how enlightened she is about a world that she had no knowledge of. Um, Ashley Luthern, who works for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, she's the crime reporter, has talked about how these stories have helped her to grow. In addition to what we do on the radio each week, um, there are news stories, uh, print stories that go along with these that tell maybe a little more, uh, give a little more detail. But Ashley, who has covered crime for the last three years at the Journal Sentinel, 
has had to go out and meet families and talk to victims or families of victims, and it's opened her up to, again, a whole new world. So um, they are all, I think, for all of them, and now we have a new producer, a young lady who just came in from Baltimore, uh, who knows nothing of this community, and I'm sure she'll go through the same kind of uh, awakening. But it's, it's something that um, you, you learn about a community uh, in, a, in ways that you might never have thought you would as a reporter, as a, as a journalist. Um, and it's a different kind of reporting. It's not just telling a story like you would for the typical daily newspaper, but you really get to know the families. You get, they have to trust you. They have to know who you are. And in, in the beginning, I used to take Emily, the, uh, Emily Foreman, who was uh, the primary storyteller on these. Um, I used to take her out to meet a lot of people because I knew a lot of the folks in the community, or they knew me. Now she can go by herself, and now she doesn't break down when she is telling these stories or when she's researching them. Um, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, so a different uh, way of thinking about cops reporting for certain. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Brent, when we talked before, one of the, th the thoughts um, you had was that the, n the need for people to know when we've done it right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there a lot of talk about when we've done it wrong. What examples can you, do you think of where uh, journalism has gotten it right on the subject? I think that, yes, and I do think it's important to talk about when you get something right, because otherwise, if you keep talking about this topic only about what you do wrong, people form an opinion about what the topic is, and, and they lose sight on the full scope of what we want to get accomplished with diversity. And I think one of the areas where I've seen uh, improvement, certainly in, in our newsroom and across our network, is the proliferation of voices. I think there are, we're telling some very good stories. Our Policing the USA, which is a, a very robust opinion site uh, run by Eileen Rivers, who actually did get diversity training through the Maynard's fault lines and gets it, uh, and has editors who understand that. And, and uh, one good example, I think, was a recent piece by Meredith Clark, University of North Texas, uh, did a column about uh, women, uh, young women who have been victims of police brutality. We heard a lot about the young black men, but what about young black women? It was a great piece. Uh, another uh, occasional series by uh, in Detroit Free Press, Mitch Album, uh, on what poor looks like. I thought it was a very good uh, a series. One particular example is a woman, Diane Bailey, who he wrote about, who's a janitorial uh, worker who uh, was very poor, had cancer, uh, and was trying to take care of her mother who had dementia, who also worked very long hours on her job because she needed the benefits. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, she gave, she would sit in her car sometimes waiting uh, uh, for the food bank to open and then share with the community, uh, very active in her church. Uh, all really, what I loved about that piece is it countered a lot of stereotypes that you often see in, in media reports uh, about young or single black women in, in, who are, are, are dealing in, in poor community, you know, dealing with a poor uh, situation. And it showed the, that she too understood and held great values, sort of the family values and community service and all the things that, that, that we hold up as, as great uh, values. And I think it's great when we can point out some of those examples. And um, I, I'm seeing more of that. Uh, so the, the, the qualities that you're identifying in that story, uh, beyond the, the, the overall effect of counteracting, counteracting stereotypes, of what? I mean, what is it about the way that the, the ingredients of that story that made it better than the average story about a poor person? Well, again, I mean, to me, I think it was the, the values that were raised out of it. I think that uh, what we should be doing, we should be challenging stereotypes and addressing them in our coverage, and that was, I think, did that. Well, it, it, what, I, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier in one of the earlier panels that. Um, the challenge around covering pathology in general, problems in general, is the risk that in focusing on it, the, the, the act itself of covering black people who are in poverty or Latinos who are in poverty, poverty is that you're reinforcing the notion that black people are in poverty and Latinos are in poverty. Yeah. 
How do you, how do you see the, um, uh, the balance of that, in, given the, 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 uh, the, the positive side of a story that combats stereotypes, even within the context of the, of the stereotype itself? Well, I mean, I think it's important to have uh, stories that show other slices of life outside of, of the poor, but I think what I, what I think was important on that piece is that, I mean, he didn't, that wasn't the only piece, he did, he did several pieces, yeah. but I think I like that particular piece because it really put a, a uh, I think it put a perspective and it really walked you through just, you know, the lifestyle of this woman and showed you in a light that I thought was, uh, it was it was a posi it was a it showed the range of the spectrum within the poor community, uh, and I thought it was I thought it was well done. Yep. Can I, can I just respond. Just I, I was thinking as, as uh, Brent was talking, I was thinking about a situation we had where we did a, a story on a school. Uh, we didn't really do it on the school. We did it on some students who lived in an area near the school. They did attend the school, but because uh, part of the story was about an anti-violence program that they have at the school. Because I think crime and violence kind of, I mean, uh, violence and, and poverty kind of go hand in hand in terms of how people view uh, the, usually the subjects of those, of those types of stories. So we were telling a story about the anti-crime or the anti-violence program at the school. The principal never heard the story, but heard that we were doing it and heard that there were some elements uh, in the story about crime and violence. And her immediate response or reaction to that was that we were doing something negative about the school, we were doing something negative about the program. So, I mean, I was thinking about your question about this tightrope that you walk, telling the story that you really have to tell, but you're not trying to paint a negative picture, you're just trying to tell the story, but the perception oftentimes is that you are speaking negatively about the subject. Um, one of the things I think that helps us with the Precious Lives series, in fact, is that we bring other voices in, which may be contrary to most you know, journalistic endeavors, but the storytellers are really the victims. Um, their voices are what's heard. You were talking about bringing in other voices. You may have been talking about media, but I think that, or, or journalists, but I think that part of what helps us through is that the people who actually tell the stories are the people who live through those stories. And then we try to, we, we have about 60 organizations that have partnered with us on this. So there's always a, a result that, uh, the end result of these stories is that people find out how to get help with these problems. So I think it's how you position the stories, how you, who you, the voices that you hear in the stories. And, and again, people's initial uh, uh, response might be one way, but you have to, if they listen long enough, they get it, hopefully. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I guess one of the things I wanted to tease out that you, that you both tackle here is that it, it isn't, we're not making a choice between the story that's, that's good and the story that gets to the deep problems, that the, uh, the ability to climb into the tough story and pr present the full complexity, nuance, completeness of people's lives itself mitigates in some ways the impact of the of the negative side of that story uh, maria you you um, you, ha you have some stories you, you you tend to use stories in the classroom to illustrate many of these points some of them aren't um, journalism at its best some of them are what 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 have we done well what do you see what do you use that we've done well that uh, and, and right right and not so, so well so i mean this idea to demonstrate voices, sometimes I use this example um, that came from um, a national news outlet. And I read this to the students, this passage. So I'll read this passage to you. And it's a story about, um, the title of the story is Evolution of Indian Identity Unfolds on the Softball Diamond. So it's a sports story. So, you know, when you think about diversity, it could happen in any section, right, of the news. And so, this is um, about the 50th anniversary of the All Indian Men's Fast Pitch Softball, and they're identifying one of the main subjects in the story, and here's the description. Lewis is certainly All Indian. He's 100% Choctaw, born in tribal territory in Oklahoma. He grew up speaking the tribe's language and still observes its traditions. 
despite years driving trucks and living among non-Indians. His skin resembles creased butterscotch. His hair runs out the back of his cap in a gray foot and a half long braid. And I read that to students and I think, what do they think of the description? And, and most of the time, students will tell me, oh, that's, that's a nice description. You know, the, the journalist did a good job of using very specific detail and describing them. And then I give them a contrast and I say, okay, well, what if I change, you know, the narrative and I, this is, Nor he's Norwegian, right? So he's 100% Norwegian stock, born of Norwegian immigrants to Minnesota. He grew up bilingual and observes the strong Norwegian work ethic, can work with others despite the Norwegian tendency to be aloof to outsiders and loves Ludafisk. He attends public schools. His skin resembles a creamy milk. His hair is so blonde it's almost white and it shines in the sun. How is that for a comparison, right? So would you use that description? Would that be okay? And students start saying, well, you know, maybe, maybe that isn't okay. But it also, I try to raise the point of privilege, because if you describe somebody as 100% any sort of ethnicity, we're living in a multicultural America where we're increasingly multiracial, right? And within specifically the native context to talk about somebody as 100% Indian is perhaps problematic in, in some respects in particular nations, right? And so you have to know enough to know that before you write this description that it could be seen as problematic when um, some nations require specific, you know, um, membership requirements to belong um, to some na nations. So I raise that and we talk about it and then we talk about, well, if we chose and changed that to another description, I mean, you, I could make it really ridiculous, right? And, and to really make the point, I could say he's 100% African American, born on a former slave plantation in Alabama. He grew up speaking plantation English with pidgin English, a slave language. His family still observes plantation tradition despite years working for IBM and living among non-blacks. His skin resembles a dark chocolate and he sports a five inch afro. I mean, comparatively, is it okay to use those kinds of descriptions? And I think, most students usually say no. And so it's showing how description and how language and how you use language, and if you don't know enough about using language, that you need to ask questions and you need to be um, kind of humble and think, well, if I'm gonna use this descriptor, and I think it goes back to what Nicole said when she says that she re re reads the descriptions back to the people that she interviews and says, how does this sound, right? Is this accurate? Would describing 100% in, you know, describing someone from a, uh, a native um, group be okay to describe them 100% something? And it goes back to the issue of who's, who's giving you the identity, right? And I mean, there are controversies over, you know, when you look at the Hispanic community, what, do you consider Hispanic somebody who's Hispanic who speaks Spanish? What about Hispanic that doesn't speak Spanish? And again, going back to country of origin, there are over 500 you know, nations in the United States and looking at Hispanics, there's a wide, broad range. And so when you think about descriptors and what you're using, it's really important to give it some serious thought. So, uh, so I'm gonna to come to the audience. Um, Eric, I wanna ask you one last question before we do that. Mm -hmm. so, so when we look ahead at what we want out of journalism on the subject. Uh, we look at issues, particularly like those that Maria just raised, things that we've heard all day about the, uh, the challenges of getting people up to speed, qualified to have the conversation. Uh, and and you're, in, you're in regular discourse with this public. How do we get there? How do we get to the place where we know enough to have the conversation, where we, where we know enough to be credible uh, with the audience, like the one you're talking to? Well, you know, 
this might sound crazy, but I don't know that they'll ever trust you. Um, I mean, you know, I think that that's a very difficult, and it's, and it's almost story to story, uh, really, and, and who's doing the story, if they know you. I, I've found that I can almost say anything on my show, and you know, sometimes I do, um, jokingly or very seriously, I'll say things. I try not to mislead anyone, uh, but, but you tease some things out sometimes just to see where people will go. Um, but I think other people in the media, other people in journalism don't have that opportunity. I get this immediate response from people on just about everything that happens. It's not that way typically, I guess, with the comment pages that have become very popular in, in uh, media now, you do have some degree of that. But you know, I hear from people right away after something is said. But I, I think it's, it's, it's all, I think I heard the previous panel, someone from the previous panel talk about it. It's about trust. I mean, if, if people don't trust the source, um, there, there's, there's righteous skepticism. So I, I, I think that how you get to that point uh, is, is very dicey, and I, I wasn't, I, maybe I'm more serious than I even thought when I said that maybe you don't get there, maybe it's, you never get there, but um, I think that the longer you have people providing information to a public, the better chance you have of getting them to, you know, raising the trust factor and accepting what comes from media. But again, it depends on the story. It depends on who the subjects of those stories are. Um, uh, because again, if it hits me the wrong way, if it's about me and I don't like the way the story is told, then that credibility and, and believability level goes way, goes way down. Brent, did you want to add something before? Uh, I know that you've got to go in a minute. Yeah, unfortunately, I do have, have the flight to catch, but I completely agree with that. I think we have to get back in the business of doing reporting. And, and you know, in this digital age, there's a lot of surveillance. There's a lot of repeating of information, mm -hmm. not a lot of reporting information. I think we need to just get back to our roots in many ways. I think, again, as I mentioned earlier, I think we need to have more, have conversations. <laughs> And have them, uh, and have those reflective moments within our within our newsroom environments. And I also think that we have to think more collaboratively, if ever before, as we're seeing how our business is, has collapsed and has become more collaborative. It's all about partnering. You know, the newsroom takes the brunt of this uh, responsibility, and rightly so, given the influence of our of our business. However, we're not going to fix the problem with newsrooms alone. It's going to take newsrooms working very closely with our colleges and universities. It's going to take us working very closely with our communities and really, you know, branching out more and talking more with each other to get this fixed. I mean, I think the singular approach doesn't work. The singular approach to addressing diversity doesn't work, in my view. I think we need to definitely uh, be more collaborative. So on that note, uh, I'm going to have to take off, and I look forward to uh, catching the, uh, I guess I can catch, it's going to be recorded, so I look forward to hearing the rest of it, and feel free to contact me. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions at that point. All right? Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, Brent. And if you've got questions, uh, just raise your hand. We've got two microphones in the back here. So we've got a question right up, uh, two right up here. Hello, and thank you. I'm Sandra Adele. I teach in the Department of Afro-American Studies. I'm a literature professor, and this is my first time coming to one of these journalism events. And I don't have a question. I have a comment. And it's simply that based on everything that you all have talked about in terms of these conversations about race and ethnicity, it makes it all the more important that in the colleges and universities and the collaborations that have, have to happen between the professionals and the students. It's so important and imperative that a university like ours uh, and Milwaukee maintain the ethnic studies programs and those courses because that's the gateway uh, to introduce uh, young people in, in colleges and universities to these issues and allow the spaces that we create for them to have the kinds of conversations that you're talking about. And then hopefully it sticks with them and they carry something of that back out into the professional realms. Thank you. Thank you. 
I should add that um, when anybody goes to college and has their first ethnic studies class, they also carry that home to their parents <laughs> and take them to task. Um, I, I, when you're talking about moving forward on race and journalism, we're trying to write about Donald Trump's nomination. And there's been some boilerplate I've seen in the media, kind of that he makes disparaging comments about women and minorities or, or you know, how, to, like how to not become his mouthpiece. Um, and I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that, because this is a, a very difficult issue about race and journalism, I think. Well, if I can just um, add one dimension to, to, to even that, that there's a, there's a, a certain um, line of thought that says that however uh, Donald Trump is delivering what he's delivering, that he is delivering something that is true beyond himself, uh, that he's talking about something that many other people are talking about, or even the ways that other people are talking about them. So. To, to a certain extent, maybe this question has two layers to it. One is, um, how, how do you determine what to talk about uh, when it's being raised by a candidate like a Donald Trump? And the other is, how do you climb into the issues beneath the, the rhetoric? Well, it's interesting. I had, uh, I've had people accuse me of promoting Donald Trump on my show simply because I talk about him simply because I talk about those things that he's saying that are inflammatory or controversial and asinine um, and, and things that just shouldn't be if you're a presidential candidate, at least in my opinion. Um, so I, I think we have to talk about, I, I, to Keith's point, the danger is, is obviously that Trump could be the Republican candidate for president. He could eventually win that's dangerous, but it's also even, in my view, more dangerous to watch all of these folks rally around him. And he serves as the mouthpiece for so many people, apparently, um, who, who agree with his point of view. That's, you know, because Donald Trump can, they can find some dirt on Donald Trump tomorrow and he could be done as a candidate. We can keep hope alive, right? Um, he could be done as a candidate. but. What about all those other people who have been emboldened by him who could possibly you know, run up the rear you know, and bring up the rear and, and uh, continue not only the rhetoric but the thought that he, that he has almost invalidated for some people in this country? Does that argue, though, um, for more journalism on this subject or less? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think it, it goes to, you know, what you're going to, you know, cover and what you think deserves column space, right? Um, and I think, I mean, I think he's brought out some of the angst that I hear from some of my students that think that, you know, in a mandatory course on diversity, if they don't want to be there, then, you know, you hear that term, political correctness. Oh, I'm not going to pay attention to this political correctness, and it's almost as a badge of honor, right? It's like I'm going to go against, you know, the the people that think that this is the right way, you know, to to be. And I think that there's inequality in our society in all sorts of different levels. And I feel that when you when you hear that pushback about political correctness. I feel sometimes um, that that comes from a feeling that someone's going to get an advantage that you're not going to get, and that they're worried about their equal chance in society, and they feel like they're not getting an equal chance. And so I think we need to, to, to ask people, you know, why do you feel this way, right? And what is actually driving your feelings on this, because I think it's important to know, because you can't address it unless you know, you know, why people are feeling the way that they are. But, you know, is this, you know, getting too much coverage? You know, terms like, you know, political correctness, racist, um, the race card, the women card, I think those are words, you know, euphemisms are words that get thrown out there, and they get thrown out there, and when they do, all of a sudden, all sorts of, all kinds of rational conversation stops because it's, it's a conversation stop, stopper. No one wants to address 
exactly, well, what do you mean by the race car? Again, it goes towards who do you think is getting an advantage in the conversation, right? If you throw out the woman card, it's saying that I'm playing something special and I'm going to get something special consideration. So all of these terms do not foster good dialogue. And is it worth covering? I think what's worth covering is saying, why aren't we having these conversations? And why are we stopping the conversation by using these terms and, and from really discussing the issues that are affecting people? Thank you. Did you have a question over here? Um, yeah, I had a question for Eric, um, kind of uh, spinning off something that you had kind of mentioned briefly. Um, uh, we're at the uh, newspaper here in Madison, the, or one of the newspapers in Madison, the State Journal, and um, what you said about the north side and the south side being code for uh, race in um, <clears throat> in Milwaukee is an issue to some extent here as well. Um, I guess I'm kind of looking for some guidance on a strategy because obviously we want to drill down and it's, it's a detail in a story that tells our readers what, what is happening where or where this thing that they're reading about is happening in a, in a level that is, you know, a quick, a, a quick reference and then a specific reference generally, you know, south side, 1380 South Park Street. So is, I guess, if that is code language, is there a way to, is there a way around that without sacrificing, <clears throat> not necessarily that drill down deeply detail, but that kind of quick, okay, now I know where, where you're talking about and going from there. Well, I think you just did it. I mean, I would probably ask you just to get some insight on what the newspapers thinking is behind the necessity to designate a, a locale. I mean, but you just said South Side, and then you gave the address as South 13th Street. So we know it's the South Side. And, and what I'm saying is it's often not about the address of the individual, or I should say it's not always about where the incident occurred as much as it's about saying this is where this person comes from. When I question why it even matters in some of the stories, some of the stories at least, um, I, I'm not talking about, again, uh, an address or a location given because that's where the incident occurred, but in identifying who the culprit was. Again, you can almost tell who committed the crime just from that designation. So I, I don't know if there's some particular reason that newspapers do that. I, I'm from Washington, D.C. originally, and so uh, we had Northwest, Southwest, Southeast, Northeast, and I don't recall them necessarily in my lifetime talking about where someone was from based on you know, those designations. But when I see it here, or at least when I see it in Milwaukee, it, it is very clear to you, I mean, it almost never fails that if it's a North Side person, it's a black person. Again, I don't know what the reason is. I probably have asked the Journal Sentinel and don't know what the answer was at this point, but is there a reason that you use that? Are, are you talking about kind of personal, so like north side man? Yes. Uh, you know, so-and-so from right. the east side. Right, right. So I think what, what Chris is talking about is more like, uh, you know, the uh, fight at the west side bar. Oh, no, again, I said I'm not talking about where they're, where they're describing where the incident right. occurred, where they're talking about the person who was involved. Well, most radio stations get their news from the newspapers. <laughs> well, if I, if I can just add one, um, <laughs> one thought to that. I mean, I, th I think this is one of those cases in journalism where, where it would help us to step back and ask the question that Eric asked a moment ago, which is, why do we do this this way? Now, here's, here's an, another reality of our towns. Uh, and I'll use, if I can, St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, the south side is the, is the side that people are referring to um, when it's coded as the black side of town. And in fact, probably the, the, uh, the concentration of black residents of St. Petersburg at 15% of the county, um, the concentration lives uh, on south of Central Avenue. Also, south of Central Avenue is a robust uh, 
upper middle class white community, also south of Central Avenue, is a robust black middle class community, along with the poor and struggling black community that people are trying to convey to us when they hit us in the ribs with their elbow and say, South Side. I think we have to figure out what we are actually trying to say and what, in fact, our audience understands. Because the South Side of St. Petersburg is diverse and broad and geographically spread. It actually has no geographic meaning that is reliable other than it's south of, Saint, of Central Avenue, uh, it, it, there is nothing that, that, that unites those three communities that I mentioned before in any, in any real way. So I think the, 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 a lot of our code in journalism needs to be examined for what it is. You know, in the same way as when in St. Petersburg you say a 97-year-old man um, had an accident, you're telling people more than just his age. You're hitting them in the ribs with that, you know, these old people in their cars, information. A lot of times we, we, have to, we have to pull it apart, try to figure out what we're actually trying to say. There's another, another question back here, no? Other questions? So, um, Eric, with the Precious Lives Project, and something that I think we've heard a couple of different times over the course of the day, um, it is hard for news outlets to sustain their daily feeding of the beast and, and covering their issues. Um, but there seems to be a lot of promise in collaboration, and Brent touched on it briefly. Could you talk more about the Precious Lives collaboration and the media partners you have, and, and is that a, a path forward to doing things a little bit differently? So maybe you know, a special projects approach for something like the State Journal, um, collaborating with other outlets. Yeah, I, I think there, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, there was a lot of opportunity. Uh, everybody involved saw a lot of opportunity for each of their uh, individual uh, outlets to, to deal with a subject matter that, that they hadn't really um, dug very deeply into. Um, the Journal Sentinel obviously covers stories, but I think that through Precious Lives and through the approach we were taking uh, with telling these stories, they had a different way, they have a different way of telling the Precious Lives stories than they did most other crime and violence related stories. Um, WUWM, uh, the NPR station in Milwaukee, certainly didn't have as an audience the kinds of listeners they have now as a result of Precious Lives. It's brought a whole new audience to them. Um, it's, it, it, is, it has kind of helped them with, they had recently, just before we started the project at least, they had done something on black male incarceration. And I think that kind of turned a light on for them and they discovered that they could reach a different audience with these different types of stories, stories that they had never really done before. So Precious Lives comes along and they see that as an extension of their efforts to talk about, unfortunately, this negative black thing. Um, because most of our stories do, there have been a few that have been uh, folks that have been other than black people, but most of them are about crime in the inner city and who lives in Milwaukee's inner city, primarily, but black people. And then we, we've done a lot on social media where there was already this kind of discussion and, and, and back and forth about these kinds of issues. But I think, again, we've opened it up to a wider range of people. So the advantage for everybody is gaining new audience, growing the audience they had, and dealing with subject matter that they typically didn't. So we've got time for one last question. Um, yeah. Do you think um, it would help if the uh, police and uh, courts reporters uh, spent more time looking at the uh, incarcerated population, going to the jail, getting a tour to jail, getting a tour to prison, and talking to people that are in prison or former prisoners about the situation in, I know it's done a lot in prison, but I think jails are being ignored a little bit. And there's huge populations, and I think there's something to be found there, and I think it would enlighten the whole conversation. 
I had students went to do a, one of their final projects on a 4-H program um, in the state where, where they could, their final project was writing a story about these women who were incarcerated and the only time they could see their, chil their children and even hold or touch their children was when um, they took part in this 4-H program that they got allowed at this one women's prison. And for the students who were going into journalism, this was eye-opening that, you know, women who were in prison couldn't even touch their children unless they were a part of this program and it just broke their hearts, you know? And the, you know, the whole concept of, you know, having these women, you know, in prison and not being able to touch your children, that's huge. And it, it totally changed the children, I mean, the students' perspectives. And I'm hoping that'll change how they view the issue and hopefully they'll, they'll become advocates for that. But I think, you know, those connections of people actually becoming part of the community and seeing what, what are the consequences? What happens to people as the result of these policies? I think it's crucial. If, if I could, just, just one of the before the gunshots portion of the Precious Lives Project, the second part of this that we're doing, um, that's about telling the stories of the perpetrators. And most of the perpetrators are incarcerated uh, that we've tried to seek. And, and unfortunately, in Wisconsin, I, I, we've had extreme difficulty trying to get into the prison to talk to people who have committed these crimes. Because the premise of, of before the gunshots is that not everybody is a hardened criminal, not everybody is the epitome of evil. Um, they have reasons, there have been a, a lot of social pressures on them that may have caused them to do the things that they've done. And we wanna see that side of it where it's, where it's present. But we can't get past the Department of Corrections to get into prison to even talk to them. So um, that's, it would be great if we could. That's what we've been using. So thank you, thank you, panel. I think um, a full day of, of talking about complexity. Uh, Katie, are you in the building?